Very few things in this world are as important to us as water. We're looking at some water molecules in their gaseous form known as water vapor. At this point the water is a gas and you'll notice the molecules are all far apart from each other. They're also moving very very quickly. Occasionally a few of them may collide and form hydrogen bonds for a very short time, fractions of a second, but mostly they remain in gaseous form. However, as the temperature cools, these molecules will start moving more slowly and they'll begin to come closer together when they, they'll collide more often and they will stay together more often when they collide. Eventually you'll see more and more hydrogen bonds forming. Just recall, oxygen has a negative, a weak negative charge to it, hydrogen has a weak positive charge. So if we've got a hydrogen from this molecule, perhaps it will form a bond with the oxygen from another water molecule, right over here. As more and more of these molecules combine, forming hydrogen bonds, more of this gaseous water will return to liquid form, as you most commonly know it. So the steam or vapor will now appear as fog or water, even the condensation on a glass or a bottle or on the mirror. Water turns from vapor to liquid when it cools against a mirror. As the water gets colder, many of these molecules will, form, will be unable to break their hydrogen bonds. As they move more and more slowly, you'll have hydrogen bonds combined. And this leads to an interesting point. You finally get a structure now this time we'll just use a single circle to represent the entire water molecule. We've got a water molecule and it forms a bond with another water molecule. These are the hydrogens. And with another molecule. And generally when water gets so cold that it can no longer break free of these hydrogen bonds, a single water molecule will connect up with four partners. It makes a three-dimensional picture. We're going to show it like this though. One thing you'll notice is that there is space in between the molecules. And so when water is in its solid state, it actually takes up more space than when it's in a liquid state. This solid state we know, of course, as ice. And ice takes up more space than the water it was made from because, again, because of the hydrogen bonds that water forms. This is what enables ice to float on top of liquid water. And it's another important emergent property of water. The main thing that makes a solid is that it forms this a crystalline structure. That means the molecules are arranged in a fixed place. And in the case of water, this happens to leave space in between the molecules which is why ice takes up more space than liquid water does. Now all these different states we're showing, water as a gaseous vapor, water as a liquid, and water as ice, are dynamic. That means when you've got liquid water, there are always a few molecules running loose and becoming vapor, and there are always a few molecules of water vapor that are condensing and becoming liquid. When ice is around zero degrees centigrade, that is, it's close to the point where it freezes and or melts, there may be a few occasional water molecules escaping as liquid and then returning to this structure and becoming ice once more. One final important characteristic of water is its ability to work as a solvent. You may recognize that this means that water can dissolve things. Let's look at how water dissolves substances on a chemical level. We're looking here at a bit of sodium chloride, that is table salt. And you may remember from our chemical bonds video that salt has positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chlorine ions. These individual ions are attracted to one another through their opposite electrical charges, and this creates what's known as an ionic bond. However, water always has a weak positive charge coming from the area of its hydrogen atoms and a very weak negative charge coming from the oxygen section. 
this can actually interfere with the attractions that occur between ions. If a water molecule gets too close, the oxygen will actually attract a piece of sodium, and the hydrogen on the water will begin to attract the, the chloride. As a result, you may eventually see a sodium ion escaping. Let's just draw this here, and a plus for sodium, and we'll show it attached to an oxygen atom, which is part of an H2O molecule. So what's happened is a piece of sodium from this sodium chloride clump has been attracted by the water. Eventually the sodium will be surrounded by the oxygen portion of the water molecules. This is how salt is dissolved in water. Given enough time and enough water, piece by piece every individual sodium ion will be drawn away by the water. In other words, the hydrogen bonds formed by water actually separate the ionic bonds of the sodium chloride. Now what happens to the chloride? You probably already know this, but I'll draw it just to make sure. Likewise, the chloride ions are going to be pulled by the positive charge that's inherent in the hydrogen atoms of water molecules. So again, the chloride gets surrounded by water molecules, and in each one, the hydrogen with its weak positive charge is attracted to the chloride with its weak negative charge. Because this happens, we say that water is a universal solvent. Many, many substances will dissolve in water. And this allows water to work for transporting nutrients and wastes through almost any kind of vessel, passageway, or organism. When all the solid salt has been dissolved, that is, it's been separated into its individual ions in the water, we say that we have a solution. And as we said already, water is the solvent, and the sodium becomes the solute. Just a few terms there. And the result is that water has a great power to transport nutrients and clean away wastes.